This is a reflection for the readings of Wednesday, the sixth week of Easter. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 15, and verses 22 to chapter 18, verse 1. The responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 148, and the gospel is from John, chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. In the first reading, we find a good example of the art of evangelization. Here we have St. Paul meeting a group of Athenians who were Greeks and who therefore had little or no background in the Old Testament, had little understanding of God's revelation to Moses, the law, the prophets, the covenant, nor any Jewish religious practices, nor did they understand even the concept of the one God, for they were polytheists, worshipping many gods of nature, as we can see from the altar they had built to the unknown God, just in case they missed any. So unlike the Jews, who the apostles had converted to Christianity, here Paul had no common background or foundation from which to build. So what does he do? What is his strategy? He begins from where they are at. He praises them for being religious and then starts to explain this unknown God in language and concepts they could understand even quoting from their own poets. He starts slowly from something they all had in common, something they could all see, hear, taste, and touch, that is, creation, and using what is called natural theology, progresses from the many effects in creation to the one transcendent cause, that is, the one God. So Paul takes the faith and, without watering it down, makes it available to his audience. In fact, Paul refrains from quoting the Old Testament at all, yet his arguments are thoroughly biblical. When, for example, Paul takes the inscription to an unknown God and turns it around by declaring the unknown God to be the God who created the world and everything in it, he is referring directly to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, that is, the Christian doctrine of creation. His next argument that builds on this doctrine that this God cannot therefore be confined to temples built by human hands, is a reference to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, where King Solomon prays, Can it indeed be that God dwells among men on earth? If the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built? End of quote. Paul's argument so far resonates with his audience, because many Greeks did accept the Stoic author Plutarch's statement, quote, It is Zeno's teaching that one should not build temples of the gods, end of quote. Again, when Paul says, From a single person he made every race of people, this is clearly a reference to Adam and Eve, but it also resonates with Greek philosophy such as Plato's notion of the one and the many. Paul goes on to reason that God has done all these things in order that humans might, quote, Grope for him and find him, though he is not far from us. End of quote. This reasoning again concurs with what the ancient Greek poets had already attested to regarding divine immanence, and Paul quotes Epimenides, In him we live, move, and have our being. Paul continues to build his logical analysis by then quoting Aratus of Soli, For we are also his offspring. Since this is the case, that we are the living children of God, Paul reasons that God must of necessity be living, and not like gold or silver or stone to be the subject of idol worship. Thus, Paul's reasoning from natural theology using elements of Greek philosophy and literature flawlessly point to the one God of the Jewish scriptures, which the Gentile should have recognized and responded to. However, from verse 30 onward, there is a dramatic shift in the argumentation when Paul introduces, with a sense of urgency, the missionary themes of repentance, judgment, and resurrection. Again, playing on the word unknown in the inscription, Paul states that the times of ignorance are at an end, and that God's overlooking or forbearance will not continue. As Paul states, quote, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all 
by raising him from the dead, end of quote. Thus, what the Gentiles did not recognize from God's revelation in nature, mediated through elements from their own culture, is now being revealed by the man God raised from the dead, who is both judge and savior. This is the climax of Paul's missionary preaching. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has offered all humanity the free gift of salvation. What St. Paul faced 2,000 years ago with the Greeks, we, in some way, are having to confront again, because although we live in a Christian society, to many people God is still unknown. And with our culture becoming ever more secular, and people once again worshiping many finite things in the place of God, we are even losing the common ground upon which to build. So St. Paul's methodology here in the first reading is instructive. That is, we start where people are at. And without watering down the faith, we use language and concepts that are familiar to them, trying to find common ground, something upon which to build. We avoid a know-it-all triumphant attitude. We make people feel accepted and build a bridge of trust, sensitive to their needs and concerns, but always moving them toward Christ and the resurrection. What are some points of common ground today that we can build upon? Once again, nature or creation fits the bill because although the scientific knowledge in Paul's day was pretty minimal, great advances have been made since, which points even more persuasively to the Judeo-Christian creator God. One such advance is the discovery that the universe is not infinite in the past. This is important because Prior to such understanding, atheists would typically argue that the God hypothesis is irrelevant because the universe did not need a creator, it has always existed infinitely, and is therefore self-existent, simply a brute fact. But observations from the Hubble telescope in the early 20th century revealed an expanding universe where galaxies were rapidly moving away from each other as seen from the red shift in the electromagnetic spectrum. This was seen everywhere in the universe without exception, indicating an expanding universe in all directions. This in turn gave rise to the Big Bang Theory, now generally accepted, where calculating the expansion backward meant that from a single point the universe began. Many other evidences, such as Einstein's theory of general relativity, and the cosmic microwave background radiation from the Big Bang have confirmed the beginning of not just the universe, but of matter, space, time, and energy, which points to the necessity of a transcendent cause that must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, and powerful. Such a cause we understand as God. The further discoveries of the fine-tuning of the universe from the very moment of its beginning in degrees that defy rational, naturalistic explanation, make the argument for God's existence even more plausible. When one turns from the macrocosm of the universe to the microcosm of the single cell, evidence piles up again, especially with the discovery of the DNA molecule, with its digital code and immense library of information that is hard to explain from a purely Darwinian evolutionary perspective. These are only a few of the many discoveries that make what St. Paul tried to achieve in Athens 2,000 years ago much more relevant to our time and a means of building a natural theology for God without appealing to scripture or special revelation. When one adds certain elements of natural philosophy, such as the five ways of St. Thomas Aquinas to prove the existence of God, the field is wide open for evangelization. The five proofs which have never been refuted are the unmoved mover, the efficient cause, the argument from contingency and necessity, gradation of being, and the argument from design. Another way to proclaim the good news, starting from language and concepts that are familiar with our audience, thereby building common ground, is to take an existential approach. We all share a common humanity and therefore experience similar dreams, aspirations, and struggles. 
personal testimony can provide access to someone who, through life's successes and failures, is open to listen. This is something we are all capable of doing because we all have a personal story. What is the angst that has afflicted humanity in the last 30 years? What has left modern man empty? For our modern culture, it is the singular pursuit of pleasure, power, wealth, and honor. Solomon discovered this truth thousands of years ago when he, after a life of every sensual experience, being satiated, cries out, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That is because we are made for ultimate fulfillment, total truth, beauty, and goodness, that is, for God. Being created in God's image means that there is an ingrained capacity for the infinite and thus a corresponding sense of the limits of this world. We come to discover that by excluding God, we end up substituting partial things, such as money and power, fame and pleasure, which then become addictive. When they don't fulfill our ultimate desires because, of course, they can't, we risk becoming lost in self-destructive behavior. But even at the best moments of life, as C.S. Lewis observed, we are most keenly aware of this longing. As he says, quote, It is in times of greatest success and accomplishment that I am aware that I still want more. That's God's image stamped in us. End of quote. This is vividly portrayed by St. Augustine in Book 6 of his autobiography, The Confessions, when he encounters a drunken beggar on the street, quote, I recall how miserable I was, and how one day you brought me to a realization of my miserable state. I was preparing to deliver a eulogy upon the emperor, in which I would tell plenty of lies, with the object of winning favor with the well-informed by my lying. So my heart was panting with anxiety and seething with feverish, corruptive thoughts. As I passed through a certain district in Milan, I noticed a poor beggar, drunk and making merry. I groaned and pointed out to the friends who were with me how many hardships our idiotic enterprises entailed. Goaded by greed, I was dragging my load of unhappiness along and feeling it all the heavier for being dragged. Yet while all our efforts were directed solely to the attainment of unclouded joy, it appeared that this beggar had already beaten us to the goal a goal which we would perhaps never reach ourselves. With the help of a few paltry coins he had collected by begging, this man was enjoying the temporal happiness for which I strove by so bitter, devious, and roundabout contrivance. His joy was no true joy to be sure, but what I was seeking in my ambition was a joy far more unreal, and he was undeniably happy while I was full of foreboding he was carefree, I apprehensive, end of quote. So at the height of his career, as a successful rhetorician on his way to deliver a speech to the emperor himself, Augustine realizes that his life is empty. The drunken beggar on the street is happier than he is. It all comes crashing down. That is why it is important for people to speak about their personal encounter of Jesus with great joy because the wine has run out for so many in our culture. Many people are lost and searching for answers. I now turn to Dante's famous poem, The Divine Comedy, which can help us see the way forward. If you remember how the poem begins, Dante is at midlife, 35 years old. He wakes up lost in a dark wood, having strayed from the true path. The dark wood here represents the worldly life, he doesn't know how he got there or how to get out. Let me now quote from the famous opening canto. At one point midway on our path in life, I came around and found myself now searching through a dark wood, the right way blurred and lost. How hard it is to say what that wood was, a wilderness savage, brute, and harsh. Only to think of it renews my fear. So bitter that thought that death is hardly worse. How I entered there I cannot say. I had become so sleepy at the moment when I first strayed, leaving the path of truth. 
A few things to notice. First, the journey is not Dante's alone. We are included. He says midway on our path in life. Second, the opening of the poem is not as negative as it may sound. To know oneself as lost is, in itself, great progress, the starting point towards conversion. It's here that the new evangelization has a tremendous advantage. More and more, people are waking up to the fact that they are lost. Modernity has failed them. The sexual revolution has left great carnage in its wake, especially at the midpoint, one begins to realize that mistakes have been made. Sin catches up and the path ahead becomes uncertain. We become disoriented and disillusioned. There can be a time when you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I don't recognize who I am. How did I get here? I started out with certain goals, but left them behind. I have become someone I don't like. Life, as Dante puts it, becomes more harsh and bitter. Of course, the first thing Dante tries to do is save himself. He sees a mountain illumined by the sun and figures all I have to do is follow the light. There are Platonic references here to knowledge and perfectibility. Like emerging from Plato's cave, Dante believes he can just think his way out of the darkness. So he begins to climb, only to be blocked by three beasts a leopard, a lion, and a wolf that symbolize his own dysfunctions. Scholars interpret these beasts as representing the triple concupiscence of lust, pride, and avarice. Dante becomes frustrated that he can't make any progress and in fact is forced to retreat back down into the valley of darkness and his fears grow more acute. What Dante needs is a guide, someone to show him the way out. A spiritual mentor. God sends Virgil, the poet, who tells Dante, the only way up is to go down. You have to first look at the consequences of your own sin and dysfunction, he tells him, before your divided will can be healed. The rest of the poem consists of a journey down through the circles of sin in the inferno and then up through the mountain of purgatory to the paradiso. This also happens to be the path of the new evangelization. But mentors are needed to help guide the journey. In fact, many mentors. In the Divine Comedy, Virgil is only the first. Later, Beatrice and then St. Bernard take over, all under the direction of our Blessed Mother. Our Church is in the ideal position to help disoriented pilgrims make that journey in so many ways. Consider, for example, the liturgical year with its different seasons. Lent reminds us of our mortality, that we are sinners and that we are going to die. Beginning with Ash Wednesdays, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. With stark reality, Lent helps us go down into our own sin through a good examination of conscience, taking a moral inventory of what led us to where we are, going all the way down to the root causes and then confessing that sin which mirrors, in a sense, Dante's journey led by Virgil through the Inferno and Purgatorio. We must be those guides, willing to accompany our brothers and sisters out of the dark wood. Personal testimony is the entry point. It's what people will listen to. We can say, I have been on this journey. I've been where you are, and here is how I found the light. The speaking of words that is so crucial to the success of the new evangelization, in a sense mirrors the creation account of Genesis chapter 1, where God spoke into the void, bringing order out of chaos. God wants to do the same in the chaos of our lives, and that of our brothers and sisters through the personal witness of those who have experienced firsthand being recreated, reordered, by God's word, Jesus Christ. At the same time, we authenticate our speech by reaching out in love, listening to their story without judgment, encountering them as God has encountered us, and personally walking with them. It is therefore imperative that we go out to the peripheries, as Pope Francis has repeatedly said, not only in the geographic sense,
but also the existential peripheries, those of the mystery of sin, of pain, of injustice, of ignorance, of doing without religion, of thought, and of all misery. This is not some optional ministry that can be left to others. Rather, it is a sacred duty. This willingness to witness will only be realized under the influence of the Holy Spirit, which is why it is the linchpin of the new evangelization. Only by His power will we wake up to our sacred duty and privilege, both because of what we have experienced, but also because of who our neighbor is, a person created in God's image and likeness, and therefore possessing inherent dignity. As C.S. Lewis explains in his homily, The Weight of Glory, quote, It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back. Lewis goes on to say, quote, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption, such as you meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with each other, all friendships, all love, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. End of quote. St. Augustine certainly recognized what was at stake when he wrote the Confessions, with the burden of his neighbor's glory clearly in sight, he testifies in painstaking detail to the dysfunctions of his daily life, the many wrong turns he made before coming to accept Christ and his church. I quote from Book 8, Chapter 1. In a spirit of thankfulness, let me recall the mercies you lavished on me, O my God. To you, let me confess them. May I be flooded with love for you, until my very bones cry out, Who is like you, O Lord? Let me offer you a sacrifice of praise, for you have snapped my bonds. How I broke them I will relate, so that all your worshippers who hear my tale may exclaim, Blessed be the Lord, blessed in heaven and earth, for great and wonderful is his name. End of quote. The power of personal testimony can never be underestimated as it accomplishes what other forms of discourse simply cannot, because unlike abstract ideas, for example, personal testimony takes place in time. It follows the shape of a human life. In fact, for Augustine, there is a communitarian aspect to this form of witness. As his story moves to its climax, there is a flurry of people whose experience finally catalyzes his conversion. First, when he goes to consult Simplicianus, spiritual father of Ambrose, Simplicianus tells Augustine the story of the conversion of Victorinus, also a professor of rhetoric, an admirer of the pagan Platonists. Augustine is no fool, and he knows exactly what is happening. Quote, I began to glow with fervor to imitate him. This, of course, was why Simplicianus had told the story to me. While he was speaking, O Lord, you were turning me around to look at myself. I saw it all and was aghast, but there was no place where I could escape from myself. End of quote. It is not only words which moved Augustine in the direction of faith. The witness of Monica, his mother, was the outstanding example of one who lived the teaching of Christ. And what he says of her influence on her husband, Patricius, he could equally have said of her influence on him. Quote, the virtues with which you have adorned her, and for which he respected, loved, and admired her, were like so many voices constantly speaking of him to you." End of quote. But Monica is not the only person whose quality of life struck Augustine. On arriving in Milan, he met Ambrose, who, quote, "...received me like a father, 
and, as bishop, told me how glad he was that I had come. My heart warmed to him, not at first as a teacher of the truth, but simply as a man who showed me kindness, end of quote. As for so many people, it was not only the ideas of Christianity which attracted Augustine, but also those truths incarnated in the flesh of real human beings. As we bring this reflection to an end, our gospel reminds us that it is not just natural theology or natural philosophy or even personal testimony that will win hearts. Rather, as Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and for this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, with the help of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to reach out to our brothers and sisters, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ.